if you're using a stunner that's rated to four and a half grain green and you're doing, like I say, young young calves with this, yes, the animal will be stunned, but all that excess energy will then be absorbed by the stunner itself. Hello, me folks. Welcome back to the Mispa Podcast. Uh, my name is Linz Kunahara. I'm your host today. Uh, we're honored to have on the episode for today, James Biondik, uh, Vice President of Ackles and Shelvok in the UK. Welcome, James. Thank you very much. So there's a lot of information, uh, a lot of data that you showed us today. Um, and I think I, I really wanted to sit down with you and, and visit more in depth about stunning, uh, some of the, the how to make, uh, how to do an efficient stunning and some of the things that you have to consider. And for our listenership, um, small and mid-sized processors that want to learn more about stunning. And, and I think uh, there's a lot of information. I know um, you've never been on a podcast, so. <laughs> but um, you know a lot, so I want to pick, uh, pick your brain today. Um, First, tell me a little bit um, some of the of the things that you recommend uh, when someone gets gets your phone. Oh, I call to you. Hey, um, I have a I have cattle, I have pigs, and they don't know what stunner to select. I, I guess we can start from from there in the beginning. So, first, just to set the stage. So, I, I think in reality, if if a customer wants to buy an Ackles and Shelvo cash stunner. Um, you, you find out whether they have a previous preference. So we obviously do, we do cylindrical and inline stunners, and we also do pistol configurations. Um, sometimes with space constraints, if the, the, the kill box is tight, um, they might not be able to get a magnum in, so we would recommend a, a pistol-shaped stunner. But in reality, the, the main two ranges that we offer, they all produce the same results, um, but the as far as the cartridge selection and the, the, the range of cartridges that stunner will take. And each stunner is rated to a particular cartridge, cartridge strength. So obviously what that end user is, is, is intending to stun um, on a regular day-to-day -day basis. And then we'd also consider if they do an unusually large stock as well. So that can be also be built into the recommendation as a consideration also. So it really is what they're going to be stunning, how big and is there a personal preference? Is there any type of restriction th that will th govern the design that they opt for? I know um, you were saying earlier um, that it's so important to have the right cartridge, uh, the right grain, and Absolutely. and and if we don't follow the requirements that, that we can find, we, we, we're going to touch here in a minute about uh, your website. It's so user friendly for some folks that want to learn more about which one to select, which one to choose. But you mentioned something about uh, if you don't use the right grain, the stunning lifespan or the, the lifespan of the stunner gets drastically decreased. So can you, can you please tell us uh, uh, what, what your thoughts are on this? Because may, we may be doing a, uh, so, something wrong. So in reality, as, as good and as high quality and well built as our product is, um, the, the fact of the matter is you, you can over stun a, a, a captive bolt stunner. So when recommending a cartridge strength for a particular sized animal, the, the thing to consider is that the stunner is relying on having a certain mass, um, i.e. the animal's head when the bolt goes into. So if you're using the most powerful cartridge that we offer on, let's say, a calf, um, obviously the animal will be stunned. Can you give us an example, like like an extunner and some like 22 or 25 caliber? Just 20, 25 in. caliber, for, okay. I think this is the most popular one in the US is 25. So if you're using a stunner that's rated to four and a half grain green and you're doing, like I say, young, young calves with this, yes, the animal will be stunned, but all that excess energy will then be absorbed by the stunner itself. So if there isn't the mass there to actually absorb the energy from the bolt, the 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 this the the bolt basically will will over travel and then that that energy is transferred back into the stunner. This basically translates to that you will get reduced lifespan of parts, 
and ultimately it will reduce the lifespan of your stunner. I like that you mentioned in this because now we can touch on on some of the questions that you get on a daily basis. What is a lifespan or the maintenance kit? How many how many times can I use a stunner before I change some of the components? So, so again, if, if you go to our website, it's very comprehensive. We have um, lifespan expectancies um, of, of, of said parts um, by stunner and by cartridge grain. So for example, main components, um, your breeches and your barrels, uh, 50 to 60,000 shots. Uh, we have bolts at 20,000 shots. Um, now these are recommended and generally far exceed. So, but we, we like to err on the side of caution. And then obviously the scenarios and environments aren't always as recommended by the manufacturer. So again, by using um, uh, too powerful a cartridge for too small an animal, yeah, it, it does reduce the lifespan of these parts. So, like I said, bolts 20,000, um, recuperator sleeves 2 to 4,000 shots. Um, but like I say, it, it's all there on our website to, awesome. to be seen. Yeah. Awesome. We'll, we'll put a, a link uh, on this video. Sure. Those folks listening will be a link uh, that will direct them to your website so you can look at uh, those specifications. And I like it a lot because you have for species and then within the species you have weights. And that's important that you're mentioning. Just use the right stunner with the right grain depending on where you're um, slaughtering. So, sure, yes. I uh, the other th question I had, and it's something that I guess I didn't tell you, but now that I'm remembering, I had a customer doing sheep uh, in in Mexico, but he had uh, some issues for because he may have a six month sheep and sometimes a one one and a half year sheep, so it's uh, the, the 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 sizes get bigger. So, what would be some of the the things to consider when you have small sheep and then sometimes you get a big one so how can you combine or some of the, your thoughts on this an uh, easy way i know it's not an easy answer because it's it gets tricky when when you're trying to say okay i have the one stunner i have one grain but when it comes to you, you look at the animals and i'm telling you about real life examples oh, absolutely because you're mentioning the, the lifespan of the stunner so speaking I mean, most popular in the UK for sheep and pigs would be the 2-2 cash special, which is the pistol, and uh, the, the cash special standard, as we call it. So predominantly, sheep farmers will use a purple power load. Given the six power loads in the range, uh, the smallest one being brown, the next one up being purple. So I hope that gives some indication of actually sheep require quite a low um, power load to have, a, have to be stunned successfully. Um, but then uh, having the correct power load for the right size animal um, is on an extreme sort of scale. So if an end user is not completely confident or comfortable with what we make as a recommendation, I would see no harm in just going one cartridge strength up to give the confidence yeah, in ensuring there's a successful first time stun ultimately. So again, if you go to our literature, it, it shows very clearly, although we don't give exact weights, obviously there's nat natural variation in skull thickness, in, in hide thickness, um, but we, we, we do offer um, a breakdown by animal size rather than weight, and we, we break it down by species as well also. So it's all, it's all very user-friendly, and it's all um, very, very practical and easy to interpret. I have two, two more questions for you. And, and now we were discussing earlier about some of the requirements in, in other countries like in the UK to become a slaughter man. So can you please tell us just so our, our listenership that they want to also uh, understand what has been done in, in Europe. And I know we we're in Germany at the IFA show this year, but Maybe in the UK, I know you're telling me about just one opportunity to become a slaughter man. And yeah, so obviously, as you can imagine, I'm with processors quite a lot, and our sales guys are as well. And so conversations I've had previously are you you get a 13-week window um, to train for your slaughter person's license. Um, within that 13 weeks, you can take your final test at any point. But then I was told that ultimately... If you fail, then you, you can never become a slaughterman again, ultimately. You, you get the one opportunity to become a slaughter person. And if you don't get it right, you're, you're not a slaughter person, ultimately. So it's, it's quite strict and, and it's, it's quite regulated and lots of legislation in the UK. Uh, now please tell me, 
to me about you, about your background, um, some of your previous experiences. Uh, how 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 do you pick uh, this industry? How did I pick this industry? So my previous employment, I worked for Caterpillar, um, uh, close to my hometown. I was there for ten years. Um, That's in Birmingham, right? Yes, yes. Um, and ultimately, unfortunately, the the company closed, or that that part of Caterpillar closed, and I was left um, looking for a new job. So eleven years ago, I applied for a position, at a company that gave me no detail whatsoever, just the, the basic requirements, and ultimately it was it was Ackles and Shellvoke, and I've, like I said, I've been there for the last eleven years now. So um, yeah, it was an intentional step into the the meat processing industry, I, I suppose would be uh, the, the honest thing to say. So you've been having the opportunity to travel the world. Uh, doing uh, some teaching and demonstrations yes. with yes, sure. So uh, myself and, and my other colleagues, we, we've travelled all over the world. Um, obviously, we operate in sixty countries through fifty distributors. We don't get to see them all, um, but uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the US, um, Japan, South Korea. Um, obviously, uh, Europe is a large part of our market as well for our products. So yeah, there's there's, there's there's been a lot of travel. Yeah. I want to emphasize uh, truly on how sturdy, how reliable this uh, stunners are. Um, and I, I don't want to say other brands out there, but what sets Eccles and Shellbook apart from from the competition? And, and I want to talk about parts because sometimes there's a you can get maybe a less a less expensive stunner. Yeah. But if you look at a two, three year plan, all the parts and, and things that you have to you have to have them ready, all the components, that sometimes can eat the cost, the first the initial cost of the of the unit. And it's again, this is a conversation they always have. Yes. So uh, I mean, in reality, there's, there's there's two or three competitors out there or other manufacturers. Okay, there's there's manufacturers that place themselves in a price range and deliver a, a product that is specifically aimed at that price range. So ultimately you get what you pay for, that they're not pretending to be anything other than anything more, um, and they're, they're a good product for where they're priced. You, you've got other companies that produce stunner ranges that are, are marketing themselves as high quality and they aren't, and then you have us who from 1913, we were the original um, developers, and manufacturers of the captive bolt stunner. First ones. First ones, yes, absolutely. Uh, we're still um, the market leading um, of, of this type of product. Um, and over ugh, over a hundred years of development, a lot of the features and the materials and some of the visuals, some of the, there's, there's, there's part, there's the elements to the parts that we fitted that ultimately through the, the constant evolution has led us to the point of the product that we have today. So there's there's elements and aspects to it that end users don't necessarily see, the tool steels, the, the hardening processes, and, and just the way the, the, the products are arranged. So uh, what makes us the best is our high level, uh, sorry, our high quality um, materials and 100 years of expertise, basically. Looking at parts as well also, um, and it's a main thing. So I cannot emphasize enough how important that is to have high quality product because the less parts, the better, right? Because you don't want to be changing parts all the time and have a high quality components within the unit. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So, and some would say we've got our business model wrong, but ultimately you're buying a premium product um, and we're supplying premium spare parts and replaceable parts for that, for, for that product. Obviously, being the original sort of manufacturer and and Ackles and Shell wrote, brought this to the market in 1913, it has been a constant development of um, I suppose trial and error in the earlier years. But the, the development on the, the the materials that we use, the arrangement of the stunners um, and the processes that we apply to the components to ensure that we get a long-lasting, reliable stunner. <clears throat> Obviously, that comes at a price, and we are a little more expensive than. Uh, let's say our, our, our next closest competitor, 
But for that little bit more, you, you, you get twice the lifespan. We have stunners five, ten years old. We have stunners from the 1940s that are still being sent back for um, for service and repair. Unfortunately, we, we, we can't support them um, because we don't do the spares or anything else, but it really is a testament to, to our product's uh, quality. Um, the parts, the spares, the consumables that go in, again, a little, a little more expensive, but I think the message here is for end users to understand its value over cost. So I have a little saying, you get what you pay for. Um, pay cheap, buy twice, however you want to look at it. So you you want to put a part that will fit in hours into the stunner and pay a little bit less. Um, it's a false economy because in reality you're, you're, you'll re be replacing that part two or three times more than you would using a genuine Ackles and Shell yeah. part. I can't remember how many times I heard that in, in, in at the IFA show with, with the Germans. Yeah. Pay cheap, pay twice in 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 German. But so it's it's a reality. Yes. Um, I, I would like to just uh, wrap up this episode by asking you uh, and pick your brain on on the global animal welfare environment. And we were talking that in the UK, it's very common to see truckers in the when transportation carrying a a stoner in case there's an injured animal, they have to end their life yeah. on site. So pl please tell us about that because I, I was not aware of I was not aware of uh, this is actually a is this a is it a mandate by the government? Yes, absolutely. So it's a, it's a legislation requirement. So when you see these large um, lorries with the the, the, the the I know in the UK that they've got two or three decks to the trailers and they've got animals on all three levels or two levels um, by requirement they must carry a, a captive bolt stunner. Um, so if there's an accident. Or, or there's, there's, they, they arrive to the delivery point, there's injured, sick, or lame, or fallen animals. They, they have a legislative requirement to carry a stunner to dispatch with that animal in a humane manner. So that's, that's basically what happens in the UK, and I believe in, in Europe as well also. All right. Well, thank you all for your time. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I, uh, we wish you safe travels back home. Um, thank you a lot. Thank you for having me.